All right. Um, so my name is Jimmy Zun, and I uh, work at Carnegie Mellon University. So I'm a uh, very different background than you guys, right? So um, my, all my degrees are in physics. So, um, so what I'm going to talk today is you don't need those cooling later, all right? Mm -hmm. If you have this technology, it's not going to heat up, right? So that's all I'm going to talk about. So it's uh, M logic is the name we gave, and it's called all spin logic circuits and uh, a device and circuits for future electronics. Okay, so this is uh, my team for this project in Carnegie Mellon, and my partner is uh, Professor Larry Palacci and he is uh, more um, on the circuit side, and I'm more on the device side, okay? And we develop this thing together, right? So this is the teams, uh, the young professors and the graduate students and postdocs. So I'll start with a very old picture, and we one of you have seen this, right? So the computer starts with uh, a vacuum tube, right? And then later on become transistors, and then later on become monolithic chips, right? And then today is wafers. All these devices, switches, <coughs> use electrons, moving electrons or holes, but they are using charge. Okay? So all this, oh, on, the, on all these devices is all about moving the charge, accumulate the charge, and measure the charge, right? Okay. So, um, so you can turn a, switch, uh, turn a gate on and off by you know, charge it or discharge it. So this is a circuit 101, right? So whenever you want to charge a capacitor, and the amount of energy you spend on stored it on the capacitor is the same the same amount of, of energy will be exhausted on the line you are supplying. Okay? Doesn't matter how you design it. Okay. So that Tesla charge, you charge how much energy you charge, how much energy you spend on the way you charge it, you need twice, okay? So that's why when you when you have CPUs, right, like uh, uh, the previous person talked about, you need a cooling, okay? If you don't have a cooling, then the CPU burns, the GPU burns, right? So, so the new concept here is you look at the electrons. Not only it carries charge, but it also carries spin, maybe a moment, okay? And the spin, you can be spin up or spin down, right? We have never used that, right? We only use charge for all electronic devices today. Right? So the talk here is all focused about the spin. Can you use spin instead of charge, right? Same thing, you're moving electrons. Okay. Okay. So spin is actually not too um, strange to any of us because you know, hard magnet, right? Magnet, you know, you have refrigerator ma made magnet, your magnet in the motor, and uh, it's all the like magnet moment. It's all right from the electron spins. Okay? So it's not as really strange, right? So um, so and uh, somebody mentioned to me about magnetic random access memory, MRA. Okay. And that's a lot of company are pushing it, quantum uh, Qualcomm is pushing for it, and Samsung's pushing for it. And, uh, and they are already um, a small size uh, of uh, MRAM they are on the market. But the idea is actually using magnet. So the idea is you have a, a magnet tunnel junction, so which basically is a resistor. And that resistance depends on the two electrodes is magnetic, whether they're magnetic moment, right, the north and south, be parallel to each other or anti parallel to each other. That give you two state, and that two state shows up as two different resistors, and then there can be four x, five x difference. Okay, and by using that, you can do a memory itself. Therefore, instead of capacitor, you use a magnetic moment to store the information, just like what you use for hard disk drive. Right, the hard disk drive, a thin layer of magnetic material, all your, you know, ter whatever terabits. It's all on, right? So, so this is uh, uh, um, the very beginning of trying to use magnetic moment to do data storage and as a memory device. Okay. So, um, so interesting enough, the 
um, so this is a, how do you, so somebody was asking, how do you measure speed? Can you, you have to, do you have to use really quantum effect to measure speed? And you don't, right? So just like, how do you, when you uh, 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 electronic device, and you, what do you do? You, you do, you have current, you have voltage. Current is electron moving, right? A hole moving in the semiconductor. And the voltage is what you measure how much electrons have accumulated, okay? So, same thing here. So, so here is what we, the, the analogous of voltage here is the magnetic moment, okay? So this is a hard, you can think of this as a hard magnet. And this is north and this is south. If it switches, the north becomes south and south becomes north, okay? So, so, so here is something called a spin transfer torque. And this is the effect that actually is, and in the 70s, dreamed of by a Professor Ed Cunningham. Okay? And if he healthy long enough, he will win the Nobel Prize for this, I guarantee you. So, so, so the effect is the following. If you have a current, you flow a current from right to the left. And here we have two magnetic layers. Okay? So we have a, a little thicker magnetic layer and a thinner magnetic layer. So when the current flows from right to left, and the electrons moving from left to right, and the electron in a normal conductor, non-magnetic wire, and is you have spin up and spin down, and spin, but it's 50-50, so you don't there's no net angular moment. Right? A spin is an angular moment. Okay. So however, when you pass through this magnetic layer, the magnetic layer does something magic. And what it does is it only allows the spins that is parallel to its direction, so it's huge discrimination here. And you only about parallel to it to flow through. And the rest, if it's opposite, it kicks back. Okay, so the transmitting electrons now, the current here is no longer the normal current. The current actually carries the angular momentum because of speed. Okay, so it's different than the regular current in a conductor wire. So when this current goes through another magnetic layer, it carries the angular momentum. It will interact with the local magnetic moment. You can flip the magnetic moment from one direction to the other. Depends on the direction of current flow. Okay, so that's called a spin transfer torque. Okay. So, um, so this in fact is today's mechanism to run in so-called MRAM that Samsung trying to replace DRAM with. Okay. So the advantage of this is if you, the DRAM is made of magnetic, right? And then it is non-volatile, means you don't need a power to maintain it. Today DRAM, you have to refresh it every millisecond. So then you, if you have MRAM as DRAM, then you don't need it. And in fact, if you, it's called instant on, right? If you switch it off and switch back on, whatever is left is whatever left on the screen, is whatever left in me memory. Because it doesn't wash away. Okay, it's there, right? Without maintaining state without power. Okay. So um, so basically this is called you know spin transfer torque. And there are um, leave this. So that's what this today's MRAM is. So you have a gate switch, control the current flow and then that you can write one or zero, okay? And to this, this basically, is like a capacitor, but it's non-volatile, okay? It's stored by magnet, stored magnetic information, too, right? So, um, and actually today, instead of this magnetic moment in the film plane, but it's perpendicular, and, that, and this one you can scale, you can scale to five nanometer size, okay? Right, so, so this is a very scalable, right? So um, we are actually the one first proposed it, and the Toshiba is the one first made the prototype. Um, now I'm going to switch gears a little bit different and then talk about something called domain wall. Okay, and that before I talk about my M logic. Okay, so what's a domain wall? It means if you take a magnetic film in one direction, the magnetic moment is in one part of the film. The magnetic moment is in one direction. The other part is the opposite direction. In between, there's a region <coughs> where the spin gradually switches. Okay. 
Okay? And this is, can be as narrow as few nanometers. So this is called a domain wall. Okay? So um, why I talk about domain wall? Because there's something magic to this. Okay? So if you take a very thin magnetic wire, and in this wire, the magnetic moment is all perpendicular. It can be up or down, but it's perpendicular to that wire. Okay. And today's all the hard disk drives are made that way. All the hard disk drive surface, the magnetic moment is all perpendicular to the field. It's either up or down, depending on the bits you record. Okay, and you can record a terabit on a surface disk, right? On a disk surface. So, so you, so you can have you said can you see in this case. On the, on the right, the main moment is down, down the right. On the left, the main moment is up. So there's a domain wall in between. Okay. If I flow electrons from left to right, and the, that means I flow the current from, left, uh, from right to left, right, flow the current from left to right, then the electron on this side is spin down. As you move across here and to this side, it becomes spin up, right? Just like what I talked about before. So the angular momentum of the current have flipped from down to up. We all know angular momentum has to be conserved. Right? So what happens is that angular momentum is being transferred to that domain wall and move that domain wall along with it. Okay? So now you can use a current to move a magnetic domain wall. So you can see um, if I, I go to this as a, I flow the electron from right to left, I move this domain wall. This region originally was up, you can see, was red, now become blue as I move it. So I switch the magnetic moment by moving this domain wall. All right, so that's one part of it. So what do you, what do you see here? You, you sit back and say, hey, although I'm flowing the electrons, I'm flowing the current, but really, it's the spin is doing the work, right? By moving the wave. It's the angular momentum of the current that is doing the work. And uh, so current is really a vehicle right now <coughs> by moving the electrons. But the real thing is, is by using spins. So, so the question is, can you generate a spin current without actually moving charge, right? So if you don't move a charge, then there's no I square R, right? And there's no heat dissipation. <coughs> so there is a, a one way to do this. There are many, many ways to, to do this. But this is one of the ways. You take a platinum field, and these are platinum atoms, okay? And you flow spins, and this in platinum field, platinum is not magnetic. So you flow the spins, you have 50% up, 50% down. However, they scatter with the platinum atom, okay? So you, sk you go scatter, and the, the, if you speed up, it goes one way. If you spin down, it goes the other, okay? In the transverse direction, okay? This is called scatter, spin dependent scatter. You can think about the, the pinballs, right? The, the, you, 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 yeah, the, the body, you know, you, you, you roll the ball one way, you roll the ball the other, and it spins different directions, okay? So, so if you look at this, so um, the spin up go in one way, spin down go the other. It's the same. This is same as spin up go in that the, this direction, right? So I have generated pure spin current. The angular momentum is move. If it's spin up, it's moving this way. <coughs> and uh, if I draw this, because there are many many atoms, so I can draw this way, and you can see the two electrons carry the same amount of charge and the same sign. They go opposite direction. So in this direction, there's no net charge flow. The charges still flow this way. There's no net charge flow. However, the spin up goes this way. The spin down goes opposite. It's the same as spin up goes this way, okay? So you get generated pure spin current. That's a non-charge flow, okay? So you can generate a pure spin current without a flowing charge in this transverse direction. So if we flip this thing 90 degrees and you generate something like this. So you put a magnetic film on top, you put a, a platinum film on the bottom, and you flow the current 
in the bottom, you generate spin up or spin into the board, going up, spin out of board, going down. Of course, it doesn't go down because the down is insulated, right? On the top, but it goes to into this magnetic field. What does it do? Uh, let me see. So I have a movie here, and that's a real experiment in my research lab. So you can see here. So here is a magnetic wire, okay? And I have a domain wall in it. And by sending a pulsed current, I can move that in the platinum field. And that, so there's a platinum field underneath the magnetic field in this wire. I'm moving, I'm putting a current, right? And then I inject a spin into the magnetic wire, just like my previous figure. And I can move that domain wall. The domain wall is moved by the vertical spin current, which has carries no charge. But the charge current is needed to deliver that current, spin current. Okay? So I can move that domain wall, right? So with all that, now I can think of a device and I can do large. Okay? So here is a device. So your transistor, you have gates, you have gates and source and, and join, right? Here I have a four terminal device. Okay? So I have a something called a right path. And the right path is a magnetic wire, very thin, and the, the, I have I trap one domain wall in the middle. On this side, the magnetic moment is down. On that side, the magnetic moment is up. Okay? Then on the top, I have something called the read path. And the read path is basically a magnetic tunnel junction, just like what I said before. You have magnetic electrodes. If these magnetic electrodes are parallel, then the resistance go through here and come out of here is low. If I move this domain wall by sending a current in the right path and move it over, then this magnetic moment reverses and there is a coupling layer that's electrically insulated by the magnetic couple and to switch this electrode. So now this resistance on the top is become a high resistance. So basically what I have is a four terminal device. I use the current pulse to control the resistor on top. But it really is a current control the resistor. Okay? Now circuit is very simple. But it's done magnetically. Right? So I switch a move a domain wall to this end, I can switch that device. Right? Vice versa. Okay? So so that's my switch switch. So now I have a switch. I want to generate a logic circuit, mm -hmm. right? Just like CMOS, you do a logic circuit, right? So here is a, uh, the ba most basic gate is an inverter, right? So what I do is I have two of these, I call this M cells. I have two of these M cells, and the read is connected in serial on this level. So here I connect to a positive voltage. There I connect to the negative voltage. And uh, here, the two electrodes across this tunnel barrier is anti-parallel. Okay, so this is a high resistance state. And here is parallel, it's a low resistance state. So if I connect this way, you know, um, if the two resistance are the same, then middle here will be set, voltage will be zero, right? But if this is high, this is low, the middle here will be higher than ground. So what I do is I connect this to the next stage, which is the same, of the right path, then to the ground. So if I have a state like this, then this voltage in the middle will be higher than the ground. So therefore, whenever I put a positive voltage pulse here, simultaneously put a both negative voltage pulse on the other side, I'll generate a current pulse. And that drives the next stage and move that domain. I switch the state of the next one. So you can see I have this four per terminal resistor that's current controlled. It, it itself has no gain, but by putting it this way, I can find out, right? I can drive the next stage. And this right past the resistance actually is very low, okay? So therefore, actually, I can drive, drive multiple states. So I can put multiple values, okay? 
So basically, a, a company should the most basic logic function inverter. Okay. So so now with the inverter, I can build any data one. Okay. So and these are all metallic. There's no transistor in this. All I need is this voltage pulse supply. And this voltage pulse is every time I pulse it, it drives the next stage. Every time I pulse it, it drives the next stage, right? So the pulse is a clock, the clock is a pulse. Okay? So it's called power clock. And more important is all these memory states, these logic states are non volatile. You can shut the power off, the state's all there. You send the pulse again, it continues. So you can think that if you build a processor with this, then the processor doesn't need, you know, so even when the power goes down, it does not, all the memory, all the logic states are still there. So when you power back, it continues. Not like what you have today, right? Yeah. So one thing is uh, you gotta make sure your memory state can stay there, right? So therefore, so um, when a domain wall moves from one side to the other, by changing the state, you need to, you can design your device so that the energy barrier is just adequate. Okay? Just like you switch today's uh, gate, right? So there's an energy barrier, and then the energy barrier makes sure your non-volatility stays. Okay? So you can design that so you can see how the uh, how a domain world moves from one side to the other. You have to climb up energy barrier and get to the other side. So um, so you can see this is a, a, a computer simulation and you can see uh, how this uh, state switching occurs right, in a very realistic uh, material set. Okay. All right. Okay. So now with that, you can design circuit. So each of this is an M cell and you can design all different circuits, right? So <coughs> there's a power clock, and you can do multiple fan out. And in CMOS, you have voltage fan out. In M logic, you have current fan out. Basically, you, you route the current, okay? And the nice thing is, um, CMOS, it works on one, one, one volt, right? The voltage cannot be too, too low, okay? Some voltage CMOS is really slow, right? So. So here, you, but however, here, it's only rely on current, not voltage. So for all the material parameters you practical you put in, you require something like 50 millivolts or below. That's all you require, 50 millivolts or below, right? So that's su substantially lower than what you have for CMOS. And the, and the power is voltage times current, right? So, you know, you lower down the voltage and, and you can do small. So, um, okay, so you can, but the thing is, um, the, F, the, the switching time of this each individual cell is not that fast. It's about a, 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 a one-tenth of a nanosecond, 100 picosecond, okay? So you really have to rely on the system design, how to do this, right? And the thing is, because every s storage memory the every state has its own its inherent memory. You don't need additional memory for it. Okay? So when you design it and you the pipeline really works well, right? So the B serial type of computation works really well. Okay? So um, uh, another thing is you can do all kinds of combination mm -hmm. logic. You don't have to do symmetric. You can do one you can double the number of devices and do a pull up or pull down. Okay? So, um, so this is a, a design of a, a physical based data path uh, for a multiplier, and so you can design M logic for it. And, uh, and this type of synthesis uh, needs to really uh, optimize for M logic performance, and, and it's different from CMOS. And the other thing is, uh, so so this is a comparison. Okay, so this is a, a ASIC sort of five twelve. Uh, hardware uh, FFT, right? Get the design. So you compare with a sub, sub voltage, uh, minimum voltage uh, CMOS. Okay? Uh, it's not compared to the full speed of CMOS, but uh, compared to a CMOS with a 
0.35 volt operating. Okay. And so, so we so we designed this using completely using M logic. Okay, this is using Verilog A, <coughs> and, 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 and that summarizes all the uh, magnetic behavior of each M cells. And so you do that, and you can see um, it. If you run CMOS at 0.35 volt, and you run uh, M logic at 0.1 volt, the M logic is 1.5 million times faster. So, so, so in a sense, is on a system wise, the M logic really can win. Okay. Although every single devices they're switching slower than the current uh, CMOS transistor. Right. And another thing is the power supply. You're supplying this power pulses. You're supplying this power clock, we call peak clock. And it does not need to be really. Uh, uh, it can be very noisy. In a sense, it's because this is a, a, a electron spins, right? All you need is the number of electrons is sufficient enough in the current pulse. Okay. So the waveform actually doesn't really matter that much. So you can have really you know, sloppy waveforms as long as the integration of that waveforms is sufficient. Right. So, and, the, and the plus, each state has a, 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 a memory, its own memory, right? You can redo it okay? if it's not sufficient to switch a state. Okay. Right. So, so the idea is you would think you have a chip that's made all M logic, and you have some crappy, crappy uh, CMOS to provide your pulse and current clock, and uh, then you can run this. Okay. The thing is, if energy disrupt, right, the power disrupt, it will still there and then come back. It will be wrong. And also, you can allow you to do power management on chip. Right. These days are very popular. Right. So, um, um, because you can completely shut a, po a portion off because you don't really need current a voltage to maintain a state. So you can save a lot of leakage current and leakage power that way. Okay? So um right, so then you say, all right, all that is on the paper, right? It's all computer simulation, it's concept, and we really want to make it. Okay? So so that's the team that I showed you in the very beginning and that's the team uh, we spent a year trying to do this. So this is our first chip. And this is not M logic circuit, but these are all M cells. Okay. So, um, so I have to show you a little bit how this is run, right. right? So, in this, you have to worry about every part. So, this is a multi magnet layers uh, stacked. Okay. It does not require a, a, a silicon boundary because you have no semiconductor, but it does require you can put a, a thin metallic field on. Okay, has adequate power. So it's a spotter machine. It's much cheaper than CMOS, but you still have to do this uh, fab. So the first thing is you have to develop this tunnel junction, and then you want to make sure this magnet moment that they are perpendicular. And these layers are each of one or two nanometers. Okay. And then you want to have uh, something called anisotropy. Then maintain the magnet moment to be perpendicular to the field. Okay. So here is a film thickness. Uh, here is anisotropy. This is perpendicular. This is in plane. Okay. So you want your magnetic property to be in this region. And look at this. This is one nanometer, right? So this requires a lot of thin film uh, material work. Um, so, right. And then you want another thing is you want the um, the magnetic resistance, the antiparallel state, and parallel state the resistance to be very different. <coughs> and this is 100% is 2x. Okay, So um, we get somewhere in, in our lab, which is not very good you know, resources, and you get you know, like 138% um, okay, of resistance change between the parallel state and the anti-parallel state. So, right, so there's a lot of material work and uh, this is the right path, the right path you really want is you want the current to be able to move this domain wall to be as minimum as possible. Okay. So you can see, so we develop this you can see very well. So this is actually magnetic multi-layers, 
And these are, you can, what you can see, these are actually atomic layers in this microscope. And you develop these multi layers so the magnetic moment can be perpendicular and can be moved easily by current. Okay. So, um, so this is uh, um, actually the same thing I showed you before. All right. So here is uh, current density. So this film are very, very thin. This is the film here is uh, one or two nanometer thick. And you run a current. So um, then, then this gives you the speed of the how fast that the wind will move. So that's really your switching speed of the, 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 the device. And this is the current density. So the higher the current density, the faster the switching speed, right? But this current, because the film is very thin, this current density actually gives you like a, a tenth microamp range. Right, so um, so here, uh, right, so right, okay, so then you have, and beca because of you run this logic, you really need to insulate the right path with the right path. You want to electrically insulate, so you have to develop some kind of insulated magnetic layer that couples the two, but it's electrically insulated layer, right? So so this is some of the work develop mag magnetic how to, how to see how they couple. And, uh, and uh, but you need a certain thickness to build this electric insulation, right? So, uh, so this is a, a, a tunnel barrier. This is actually a stack of film. So what you do is you deposit a stack of film, and each layer you worked out a recipe how to do this, okay? And then you pattern them, right? <laughs> so you pattern them into a device, okay? So this is all straight iron mill. Okay, um, right? You can you can make the wire as small as 20 nanometers for in our lab. Okay, and uh, but the, for the device, you actually can scale, and the wire can be as thin as five nanometers. It still will work. <coughs> so so there's a tremendous scalability, but this is one of the M cells, and you see, and the, and the, you can, so this is one, one of the M cells we fabricated. And this is a cross section. This is transmission electron microscope. So you can see. This is the tunnel barrier. This is the, the one of the electrodes. And this is the other the read, read electrode. And this is the right path. Right. This is actually in scale. Okay. So 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 this is actually not not easy. Right. It's about a year work. Right. So um, so you can see you can switch them cell. Um, right. And then um, you see in this case you actually should switch all the way up. But uh, somehow the domain will get stuck in between the two electrodes and the read electrodes on the top. Okay, so you move one way and you s do a second step, right? So you f you have to increase the current density so that they can switch always in one step. If the current is some minimal, then you have to do a few tries. Okay, so right, so this is the development work, right? So, but uh, uh, after. You figure it out, you figure out how much current you need, and here you go. So the blue is you switch the right path current. The red is the read path resistance change. So you can see every time you write, write it, switch the polarity of the current, you switch the resistance of the read path, okay? Every time, right? So this is a test, and so right now we're combining this to, do, to look at, a, a demonstrate the logic circuits, right? So what do we have done? We have use the spin, but we are still using voltage and current to route the spin current, okay? But however, in this case, the real, like the voltage in electronic device is the logic state, our magnetic moment direction is a logic state. And like the current in your, uh, um, analogous to your current in your electronic device, we use the spin current in our device, right? So, so, so that's how uh, this is done. But the event, but the, this is still interface with CMOS. So, um, so it's not really pure spin current device, and so it's an, sort of a hybrid, right? So, okay. So, so we're looking forward to if this technology is successful, it will re sub substantially reduce the power consumption <coughs> for uh, uh, IC chip or for a processor. Right? And, uh, and it can be made much cheaper because it's all metallic and can be scaled much better. Okay? Because really five nanometers below, you can do it. Okay? 
Um, so that is, uh, these are the publications that you're asking, the British publications. So this is a publication we had uh, since the beginning of the projects, and uh, um, right? And the way, this is it. Thank you. Yes. So uh, when you mentioned that you, the, the, your, your, your analogic devices are, are proof against the radiation, Right. Uh, so what radiation, did, did you actually test anything? For example, did you test against, say, for example, neutron radiation or gamma ray? Oh, well, it doesn't I matter. I gamma ray right. radiation, for example. Right, Does, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. And yes, mainly against charged particles, right? Okay. So like you go to Mars and you can store, okay. you store your uh, program in glass and okay. that's how it gets erased. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yes? So you said that you've got problems with pinning. Right. Uh, if you were to, you're currently scaling this thing at about a half a micron, is that the typical device size? Uh, about 100 nanometers, 0.1 oh. micron. Okay. Now, if, in order to be competitive against contemporary flash, you're going to have mm. to scale it down to maybe 10, 10 nanometers. Correct. And you're going to have a lot of edge effects. So do you have models or some understanding of what the edge effects and the impact of the pinning from that will be? Very good question. So that's something really we're trying to spend a lot of time working on. Yes. So we do see this effect when you go very small, narrow line, right? You get more pinning effects. Yeah. Yes. And that's very obvious. However, a lot of it is because when you mill it, you, you, you have a photoresist, so oxidize it on the edge. And the magnetic oxides, usually they are anti-ferromagnetic, and that's where the pinning comes from. So what you have to do is, when you mill it, you have to passivate it right away. And I think that, that will help you. you, know, you know, so do you, do you wet etch it or hydrogen plasma or what? Oh no, you you go vacuum, you mill it, and then you deposit it in the same chamber. You deposit a passive a, a, a layer covering it, so they not get exposed to air to up, to be oxidized. Right. Okay. okay. So that might be a solution. Yes. What environment is most suitable for the stability of your fridge? The what? Within the spin system, which environment or protection of, of the environment do you need to maintain the stability of the switching circuit? You don't need any special environment. Do you have magnetic fields? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a field or, or a spin influence field? The, the, um, the field endurance in these films are very high. So they are like a, a Tesla range. <coughs> yeah. Yes? Yeah. You had mentioned the disparity in performance earlier. I know that I mean, a lot of folks here, a little bit of power would be present. But you had mentioned that your current devices are slower than CMOS, but the potential was now. What's the disparity? So um, the idea is, so if you look at a um, CMOS switching, right? Each individual CMOS transistor switching is what? 10, 10 picosecond, right? <coughs> We're 10 times long, slower. Okay. But however, um, if you look at it, um, you need a memory, you need a weighting, you need a, um, because <coughs> on, on a system view, we actually a little bit faster if you design this compiled to you know, regular CMOS. And so, for example, they are design FFT, right? We're about a factor two faster. So depending on how you do the circuit design, that utilize the inherent memory and that's the, the, the only gain you're gonna come up with is a system design gain. Right. And because of this non-volatility non of the memory, and that because of this, and uh, the memory is inherent, right? It is it's free. Yes? A question about the self-clocking aspect of the, uh, the M-cell logic. Right. Um, so even 10 years ago, more than 30% of the chip power is used for clocking uh, on the synchronous chip, the synchronous CMOS chip. Okay. Um, and today, like, it's probably even more power spent on the clock circuit. Right. Uh, there is the aspect of the self-timed uh, asynchronous uh, CMOS circuit that can adapt to uh, basically the self-timed uh, paradigm of that. You can do this. Is, yeah. is yeah. there some similar you set can, you of can system do that? that yeah. You can do that here as well. And in terms of the power that, or the energy that's required, not the power, but the energy that's required for uh, keep making sure that the logic is propagating appropriately, 
Um, is this more similar to the asynchronous type where you don't have a globally synchronous regime anymore? Or is there a similar? I'm not familiar with CMOS. OK. So, but, uh, um, but there you, this thing you can, because the state is always there, right? Mm -hmm. And whenever you change it, it's, it's inherited there. Mm -hmm. So the asynchronous is much easier to implement here. Mm. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. I mentioned about that it was cheaper than two months, but I saw more uh, the size. You were saying it was more. Uh, how big would the? So so in the sense of you you today you build a semiconductor fab, is yeah. close to no. ten billion, right? No no, but I'm saying the size of the chip. So the the M cell can you can do it uh, eight bit F score, okay. But moreover is you can actually stack them up because they're metal. You can stack them up at infinity one. Okay, that's one of the major advantage. Yes. So what would be the granularity of switching, say, of computing power versus real power? Say it again. How would be in power pr proportionality realized in those devices? How much you can, how, what is the size of the I think uh, you can switch it off, say, and switch it on? You know, if you take power. some practical, so of course we haven't really done the, the, mm -hmm. the, the development yet, right? So if you look at the, the material, the, the property today's material can provide to you mm -hmm. and uh, available now, you at least talk about the order magnitude reduction of power compound to signals. Yes. So currently your clock line is DC, right? No, currently no. I send in pulse, like a, a two nanosecond, to five nanosecond. Pulse, what do you mean DC pulse? It's it's just, it's just direct current. Just direct current, but it just uh, right. right direct so current pulse. So yes. <coughs> pulse. Right. right. Have you thought about AC pulse? Interesting. You could. Yeah, you can do. Switch back from those. Yes. Infinite spaceship. Right. Just curious, how do you simulate the system? You you were showing a bunch of simulations. So right. So in, in the chip simulation, take basically you write a, a very large model of your M cell behavior and put it in, into cadence. Okay. <laughs> That's what you do. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so currently you're, you're moving the domain wall back and forth with the with the current pulses. Right. Um, and you talk about if you don't have enough current pulse, it, it might get stuck halfway. Right, 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 right. right. Well, the device actually, I made. Right. right, right. But but can you actually use it as an extra state and have it like a multiple level cell for storage? Um, you could easily. Right. Yes, you could easily. Well, how would that would that make any difference for logic? For storage, I can see where that you, might be. You can do the non-binary, right? Mm -hmm. So you can do non-binary mm -hmm. logic. Sure. Yes. Yes. Uh, do you have an idea what the density is like versus, say, memoristor technology? Um, memoristor is a different piece, right? Yeah. So, right. So it's more nonlinear device. But I think uh, the uh, density here is similar to memoristor. Right. But it's a three terminal device instead of two, or four terminal device instead of two. Right? Yeah. So, so the the main thing is you can make this wire very very thin. So it's a, like a really one-dimensional thing, right? Then you need, yeah. Okay. But the, the yeah the th the thing is, you can as I said, you, different than 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 the three D semiconductor. This thing can it's naturally three D. Yes. All right. One last question. So, assuming this pans out long run, right? You're saying okay, it's not a semiconductor device. I mean, like by a printer. At home, yes. you buy a printer. What? Yeah. Conceivably, if it's not a semiconductor device, right? I can have a small consumer model of something that will at home. Probably you could, and sometime in the future, <laughs> <laughs> you could, right? All right, Madonna, thank you. When you get there, let me know. All right. <laughs> thank you. Okay. That's outstanding. Thank you. So there will be uh, some more time for you to uh, yeah. network. Oh, right. uh, one so, announcement. I, uh, so uh, uh, this is our 42nd meetup. And uh, there is something special about number 42nd.
Um, <laughs> so, uh, as you know, uh, as you've seen from the web webpage, there is uh, no other meetup planned at this location. We're actually trying to mix things up a little bit and see what else we can arrange going from the 43rd onwards. So stay tuned for more news.